Now for stages of labor. Hey guys, I am Nurse Barbara here with Nurse Mike. Yeah. <laughs> and right now we are covering all of the key points that you need to know for your nursing school exams. Labor is the delivery of the baby from the mother and into the world. Now some key points to write down. The fetus is considered full term when labor occurs 37 to 42 weeks. Now premature labor occurs before 37 weeks. So to cover the four stages of labor, here's Nurse Barb. So there are four stages of labor. Stage one begins with uterine contractions to help open up that cervix. And this is known as cervix dilation. This is so that the baby can pass through and the goal here is to get to 10 centimeters of dilation. Stage two is the delivery of the baby. The goal here is to push that baby out. Stage three is the placenta delivery. And finally, stage four is the postpartum recovery stage. The goal here is don't let your client bleed to death. Now, the whole process typically takes around 12 to 18 hours, but time can vary greatly. Thanks, Nurse Barbara. Now, before going into the detail of each stage, let's cover some top-tested key points about true labor in stage one. So please be sure to write this down. So the four signs of true labor before birth, it's all about cervical changes. Remember, the cervix is like the door to the uterus, which I call the baby apartment or the baby condo. This is where the baby grows and develops. So the signs of cervical change include, number one, a bloody show. This is mucus and blood. Number two is water breaking. This is where the amniotic sac ruptures and clear watery fluid discharges from the mother. Number three is true labor contractions. These contractions progress in key terms, increased frequency that are regular and rhythmic, and increased intensity and duration. Now these contractions cause progressive cervical changes to open up the cervix. The contractions should feel like rhythmic waves of the ocean that become stronger in intensity and duration as the baby is coming out. Now true contractions pull on the thick cervix for these specific changes to the cervix. So number four, the cervix, there are two key terms to know. Number one is dilation, how wide the cervix is opening up. Remember the goal here is 10 centimeters. So for the memory trick is the double Ds. D for dilation is D, the door is opening. Now it's measured in centimeters, zero to 10 centimeters. Remember 10 centimeters is the goal. This is the perfect 10. It means the baby is ready to come out. And the second key term here is effacement. This is when the cervix gets thinner and shorter as the cervix stretches upward with contractions. So the memory trick is the double E's. E for effacement is E for elastic cervix that gets thinner and shorter. So it's measured in percentages from zero to 100%. So be sure to pause the screen and write down those key points. Now students have a hard time visualizing shortening of the cervix. When you do a vaginal exam, you literally stick a sterile gloved finger in through the cervix and you measure how thick it is. If it's as thick as your finger, it's 0%. To your middle knuckle is 50%. Now halfway between the tip and your first knuckle is 80%. And if it's paper thin, then it's 100%. Hey there, nursing student, listen up. Did you know only 20% of our videos are here on YouTube? You're missing out on over 900 videos not on YouTube, plus 500 visual study guides that follow along every video, and a massive quiz bank to test your knowledge. All neatly organized in our new app. Try it for free. Visit simplenursing.com today. So just think, the door is opening up to let the baby into the world. So a Kaplan question mentions, four centimeters dilated and 60% effaced. Explain the meaning of this information. The opening of the cervix is four centimeters wide and the cervical canal is 60% shorter than normal. Now as a little side note, there are false contractions called Braxton Hicks contraction. So be sure to write this down. Again, these are false labor contractions, also called practice contractions, as they disappear with walking or position changes. 
no dilation of the cervix occurs, making it a false labor sign. So a HESI question mentions false labor contractions. They decrease in intensity with ambulation. Yes, true labor contractions don't go anywhere. Remember, they are here to stay. So a little recap for true labor versus false labor. So contractions in true labor are regular. Remember, they increase in frequency, duration, and intensity, where false labor is irregular in terms of contractions. And for pain, in true labor, it does not decrease with rest. For false labor, it's alleviated with rest or position changes. And for the cervix, with true labor, it's progressive change and dilation with effacement. And for false labor, there's no change to the cervix. Now let's go over to Nurse Barb for some top missed NCLEX questions. So now two top missed NCLEX questions. The first one is, which signs are most indicative of true labor? Select all that apply. So we would select pain in the lower back that moves to the lower abdomen, progressive cervical effacement and dilation, regular and rhythmic contractions that increase in frequency, and lastly, contractions that become more intense with walking. But remember, cervical change with dilation and effacement are the only true diagnostics of actual true labor. The other signs are just signs that true labor is present. Now, question two, which questions would help determine if the client is in true labor? Select all that apply. Firstly, do you feel like the contractions are getting stronger? Does anything you do make the pain better? Do the contractions feel the same when lying down? How frequent are the contractions? And lastly, where do you feel the contraction pain most? Remember, true labor increases in intensity and the cervical change is progressive. Wow, all right then, yes ma'am. Okay, lastly, as a little side note here, back pain or back labor is a big NCLEX tip. Lower back pain experienced with contractions is likely when the fetus is in occiput posterior position, that OP. So make sure to pause the screen and note how this image looks. It's always highly tested on exams and the NCLEX. Over 70% of students got this wrong. So the memory trick here is OP. Oh, poop, it is not good. So the back of the baby's head is against the maternal spine. This means slow progression, long labor, and severe back pain. So OP, once again, think oh poop, as it can lead to labor constipation. Remember, labor is an active process. You have to move and groove. To support progression, you must ambulate, change positions, and squat. So two big interventions to control back labor pain and get the baby in the right position. Number one, apply counter pressure to the sacrum during contractions, which is a big NCLEX tip. Number two, reposition the mother on her hands and knees with the birth ball and encourage to change positions every 30 to 60 minutes. Now this is done during labor to promote fetal rotation and descent. So be sure to pause the screen and write down the bolded and highlighted words here as these are the most tested. Now don't let the NCLEX trick you here. No position changes and remaining in bed during early labor actually increases the risk for persistent fetal malposition and will also slow labor progression. And number two is left lateral position will not alleviate the client's back pain. This position is good for fetal oxygenation and blood flow, but not really good for back pain. Now for a HESI question, which supportive care measure for back labor pain? lean over a birth ball with her knees on the floor. Now over to Barb for some top missed NCLEX questions. First question, the client reports intense back pain and the fetal position is the right occiput posterior. Which intervention would help alleviate the back pain during early labor? The answer here is to apply counter pressure to the sacrum during contractions. And question two, an appropriate task to delegate to the unlicensed assistive personnel or the UAP. And the answer here is to reposition an unmedicated client who is in active labor onto a birthing ball. Remember the key term here is 
unmedicated client. Now, do not let the NCLEX trick you. Nursing aides, those UAPs, can help with position changes, although they cannot do assessments or re-evaluation of client status. Okay, now that we covered the top tested info, let's dive into the details. Thanks, Nurse Barb. Now, starting with the first stage of labor, this is the longest stage, typically lasting around 20 hours. So this stage is broken down into three phases. First is the early or latent phase. This is where the client is relaxed and contractions are mild. Number two is the active phase. This is where things get super serious. Breathing techniques are in full swing and the client is typically irritable. And the transitional phase is when the cervix dilates to that perfect 10. We see rapid, intense contractions, often with vomiting and an urge to poop, with intense moans and groans. Often the client is saying, get this freaking baby out of me. Remember, stage one begins with the onset of labor and ends with full cervical dilation at 10 centimeters. Once again, the perfect 10. So let's dive into details of phase one. So remember, phase one is that early or latent phase. And a quick test tip here, don't get bogged down by all the numbers just yet. Focus on how the patient is acting and presenting and what her needs are going to be during this phase or stage. So with the early phase, think we must give mom early education and encouragement. And the cervix is zero to three centimeters dilated. Remember, the baby door is opening up in that dilation and becoming zero to 30% effaced. We have a thinner cervix here. Now this is the longest phase for first time mothers. Now as the cervix begins to stretch, it triggers oxytocin release in the mother's hypothalamus and posterior pituitary within the brain. Now the big key point here is that oxytocin stimulates uterine contractions. Write it down, huge key point. Now in terms of contractions, they are irregular, known as irregular contractions. These contractions are short and far apart. So the frequency is every five to 30 minutes and the duration is short, like 30 seconds. And now we also want to monitor fetal heart rate as it's the main indicator to see if the fetus is receiving enough oxygen. Now the big priority here is to assess for late decelerations. This means that there's not enough oxygen getting to the baby. So key term right there, late D cells. So ATI mentions latent phase of labor, contractions every five to 10 minutes. Yes, it's within that five to 30 minute window. And a HESI question, what do you closely monitor during the latent phase of the first stage of labor? Fetal heart rate. And a Kaplan question, the purpose of a fetal monitor to determine if the fetus is receiving an adequate amount of oxygen. Now for phase two, over to Nurse Barbara. On to phase two, which is the active phase. We want mom to go to the hospital. And this is where the cervix is getting wider. The focus of this phase is breathing techniques and pain management. The cervix will be dilating between four and seven centimeters. Now remember that 10 centimeters is considered full dilation and our goal is to get to that perfect 10. The cervix will also continue thinning and contractions will become stronger and longer. The frequency is about three to five minutes apart and duration is about one minute or so. But most exam questions don't ask specifics, rather focus on the stronger and longer. At this point, the water may break, meaning that the amniotic sac ruptures and mom may start to feel a little more restless and anxious, so we can provide pain medications. The options include epidural, which is a procedure that injects a local anesthetic into the space around the spinal nerves in the lower back. And this is in order to block the pain from labor contractions. IV narcotics are also given, but remember that they are given slowly during the peak of contractions. This is a huge NCLEX tip. Remember, slowly during the peak of contractions. Over 50% of students got this wrong. Remember, narcotics make the vitals low and slow. This leads to newborn sedation and respiratory depression at birth. IV narcotics given at the peak of the contractions 
reduce the amount of narcotic that crosses that placental barrier, and this will help decrease the sedation of the fetus. Now for a top missed NCLEX question. A client in latent labor receiving an oxytocin infusion for labor augmentation is requesting IV pain medication. Which nursing action is appropriate? So we want to give the medication slowly during the peak of the next contraction. Remember those key terms, slowly during the peak of the contraction. This is to decrease respiratory depression in the baby. And do not let the NCLEX trick you here. There is no need to discontinue the oxytocin prior to a pain medication. Just be sure to give it in its own separate IV port. Now moving on to phase three, which is the transitional phase. We want to help mom to focus and stay in control. The cervix dilates from eight to 10 centimeters in this phase. And remember that 10 centimeters is considered full dilation. And our goal here is to get to that perfect 10. So memory trick is think perfect 10. The cervix will become fully effaced and contractions here are the strongest and closest together. Clients who don't have epidural pain control will be losing their mind. Moans and groans sound deep and long as contractions get stronger and the most intense. So they'll be back to back and start to overlap. Now, five key points I want you guys to write down. Number one, anxiety and vomiting. So vomiting is that big key term over here. Secondly, there is an urge to have a bowel movement. This is because of that rectal pressure from the baby that's descending down onto the pelvis. Third is that there is a strong urge to push with every contraction. But fourth, we do not want to push until 10 centimeters dilated. Remember, 10 centimeters is full dilation. The reason we don't push is because there is a risk for cervical swelling and lacerations. And lastly, number five, the amniotic sac often ruptures. You may also see a bloody show, which is that thick, bloody mucus. Now, the priority here is to assess the color of the amniotic fluid. Remember, this is that water breaking. Firstly is meconium stained fluid that appears as a dark fluid. This is a sign of fetal distress or hypoxia and is a huge aspiration risk. So, Hesse had a question expected during the transition phase of the first stage of labor. So this includes vomiting, bloody mucus, and the urge to have a bowel movement. Now some interventions. Remember the client is in extreme pain at this point and is feeling very anxious. So four NCLEX tips to go over. Number one, emotional support and encouragement is vital. Secondly, we want to provide breathing techniques. Third is 10 centimeters dilated. We want to document the fetal heart rate every 15 minutes, as mentioned by Saunders. Last but not least, we want to avoid pushing until 10 centimeters. So that's the full dilation. If we push before then, there is a risk for cervical swelling and lacerations. Now for a top missed NCLEX question. Hey you, are you still watching? Well, don't miss out on the rest of this video and the full course not here on YouTube. Plus, get free access to tons of practice questions and beautiful study guides. Simply click right here. A laboring client reports anxiety, vomiting, and the need to have a bowel movement. What is the expected cervical examination finding? So option B is the most correct as these signs correlate to phase three, that transitional phase. Eight to 10 centimeters dilated and 100% effaced. So option A and C would be incorrect. Oh, and if you chose option D, then you bad. Hmm, 30% less calorie. Oh. Well yeah, how could you? All right, now for the second stage of labor, the delivery of the baby. This is also called the descent phase or the pushing phase. We're pushing that baby out of the birth canal. So the four key points to write down. Number one, the cervix must be 100% effaced and 10 centimeters dilated. 
Remember, the key number is 10 centimeters. Once again, the memory trick here is the perfect 10. Number two is the signs. Increase in contractions and the urge to push or poop. Basically, defecate. Which makes sense since we're using the same pelvic muscles that we'd use for a bowel movement. Now, a big key term here is the Ferguson reflex. This is the spontaneous urge to push during labor. It occurs when the presenting part of the fetus reaches the pelvic floor. Hello, is it me you're looking for? So, big HESI question here. The second stage of labor, significant increase in contractions, Ferguson reflex is activated, and the client experiences a strong urge to bear down. Now moving on to number three, the interventions here. Remember, positioning of the mother is priority. High Fowler's lithotomy or sideline position. And we must educate the client to push properly, since the epidural may decrease feelings of contractions. So number one, avoid holding the breath and tightening the abdomen. Encourage the mother to keep breathing. Number two, push when feeling the urge. And number three, breathe in deep and breathe out slowly through the mouth and keep the mouth open while pushing down. This was mentioned by Hesse to help increase oxygen to the fetus. Now number four are the assessments. These are more important during the second stage as mentioned by Hesse. So fetal heart rate before, during, and after the contraction. Frequency of contractions, duration of contractions, as well as uterine tone between contractions. All of these showed up on a few Select All That Apply questions. Now, speaking of Select All That Apply questions, a very tricky NCLEX question came up during our review. So a top missed NCLEX question. A client presents to the emergency department after her water broke. She appears anxious and in pain, bearing down with each contraction. What assessment questions should the nurse ask immediately to prepare for birth and potential newborn resuscitation. Select all that apply here. So the answer options. When your water broke, what was the color of the fluid? Yes, remember, color is critical. Meconium stained fluid, that dark fluid, is a very bad sign, indicating risk for fetal distress, hypoxia, and even a big aspiration risk. Next is what is your expected due date, the EDD? Also called estimated gestational age. Remember, preterm newborns are considered less than 37 weeks gestation and are at the highest risk for respiratory distress after birth, as the baby's lungs are not fully developed at this point of the pregnancy. And we also want to ask, how many babies are you expecting? Because preparing for multiple newborns requires more staff and more resources. Another answer option is, do you have any active sexually transmitted diseases? since this would indicate if a C-section would be needed if there's an active STI. For example, active herpes if there's an active outbreak. And very lastly, recently, have you taken any medications, opioids, or illicit drugs? As certain medications and drugs like opioids can cause respiratory depression in the newborn. So remember, opioids make the vitals low and slow. Now moving on to the third stage of labor, the placenta delivery. The uterus contracts and the placenta slowly detaches from the uterine wall. Now the placenta must be carefully delivered. Never pull on the cord to deliver the placenta, as this can lead to a high risk for tearing the placenta and leaving behind placenta parts, and even possible uterine inversion, where the entire uterus flips inside out, both of which put the patient at high risk for hemorrhage and even infection. So remember, the client is at high risk for infection, if placenta parts are not fully removed from the uterus, as well as uterine inversion if there's pulling on the cord, which can lead to severe hemorrhage or that bleeding. And this can lead to decreasing blood pressure and increasing heart rate. So the longer it takes for placenta delivery, the higher the risk for hemorrhage. Now in terms of pharmacology after placenta delivery, just think of the double P's here. P for placenta delivery, we give P for Pitocin or oxytocin, to prevent hemorrhage. So remember, the key point is oxytocin stimulates uterine contractions. So just think of the C, and oxytocin helps the uterus to contract. 
So the ATI question, the third stage of labor, the baby has been delivered and the mother is now delivering the placenta. Finally, we have our fourth stage of labor, also called the recovery period. This recovery stage lasts around two to four hours after birth. And at this point, we encourage skin to skin and breastfeeding for multiple reasons. Now, breastfeeding stimulates maternal oxytocin release, which helps contract that uterus. It provides nourishment and supports the blood sugar of the newborn. Now, be sure to write this down. Assessments for the mother. We put priority on blood loss and infection. So when it comes to infection, a temperature over 100.4 requires further evaluation. Now, having a slightly elevated temperature in the first 24 hours following delivery is a normal physiological finding. Now, moving on to hemorrhage, especially if the mother had a complication related to a lacerated birth canal, which is basically the tearing open of the tissues. So write this down. The priority assessments here include monitoring the peripads. Remember, peripads are priority. The key term is fully saturated in less than one hour. Many question banks had different ways of saying this. For example, one pad in 15 minutes or one pad every five minutes. We also want to monitor for a decreasing blood pressure and an increasing heart rate, as these both indicate severe hemorrhaging. Now onto the interventions. The fundus is first. This is that top portion of the uterus, and if it's soft and boggy, we want to massage until firm. This will help make it contract and stop bleeding. We want to encourage voiding or the use of a catheter, like an in and out, since a full bladder can displace that fundus and prevent it from fully contracting to stop the bleeding, which we will cover in detail in a moment. Pitocin or oxytocin is given IV or IM. This is a synthetic hormone that causes the uterus to contract. It's used to control the bleeding after childbirth, but also to induce labor before birth as well. Lastly, we have breastfeeding. This stimulates the release of natural oxytocin from the mother, which again helps that uterus to contract and stop bleeding. Now, it is important to know that during this phase, uterine involution occurs. This is where the uterus returns to that pre-pregnant size and location, and it continues until 15 to 21 days after delivery. A fundus assessment, as mentioned before, is key to help stop the bleeding. It must be firm, so write this down. You want to assess three times every five minutes then every 15 minutes for a full hour. So, how should a fundus feel? Well, it's funny, just you ask. All right, all right, bad joke. We're just gonna have some fun with the fundus. Now, a normal fundus should be firm midline and level with the umbilicus, or basically the belly button. And a little side note here, 12 hours after, it should be at at least one centimeter above the umbilicus, and will descend about one to two centimeters every 24 hours. Now, what's not normal is a displaced fundus above the umbilicus or to one side, typically from bladder distension or basically a full bladder. So think of the bladder and the uterus like two cowboys in an old Western movie. They're both saying this town ain't big enough for the both of us. If the bladder's full, it's gonna push the fundus out of town. And if the fundus is out of town, well, it can't do its job in contracting, resulting in major bleeding. Now, in terms of interventions, we ask the client to void every two to three hours. Now, we typically have the client walk to the bathroom, but a bedpan is preferred if the client has been given pain meds, as clients are at higher risk for falls from that orthostatic hypotension, that low blood pressure upon standing. Remember, especially after general or regional anesthesia. And if the client can't void, then an in-and-out catheter is used, which is a huge NCLEX tip. Remember, an in and out catheter are for clients if they're unable to walk or even unable to void on their own due to an epidural or even other pain meds. Now the next key term is a soft or boggy fundus. This is what's called uterine atony, as it increases the risk for hemorrhaging. So a big intervention here is oxytocin infusion. 
As mentioned before, it contracts the uterus to control the bleeding. And we can also do a fundal massage to make that fundus firm and prevent the bleeding. Now, these are only a few interventions. We go into full detail in the postpartum hemorrhage video, which is located in the postpartum section. But the big key point here is we always massage the fundus and void. Now for some top missed NCLEX questions. Let's take it over to Nurse Barbara. So question one, a client who gave birth vaginally with epidural anesthesia reports no urge to urinate three hours after birth. The client's fundus is above the umbilicus, but three centimeters to the right. What should the nurse do next? And the answer here is to perform that in and out catheterization. Remember, for the NCLEX, safety is always the number one priority. When given the option, we'll start with the least invasive and go up to the most invasive. Clearly, the patient should urinate, even if she doesn't have the urge or if she can't move her legs from the epidural, but we must move to more invasive measures, such as a straight catheter. Moving on to question two, a client who had a vaginal birth one hour ago has a boggy fundus that is deviated to the left and above the umbilicus. Which intervention should the nurse perform first? And the answer here is to assist the client to use the bedpan to void. Moving on to ATI, a client delivered a baby eight hours ago, the fundus is boggy and soft. Which interventions are the most appropriate? Select all that apply. So firmly massage the fundus, encourage the client to void, and administer methogen per orders. Methogen is an analgesic and uterotonic that is used to treat severe bleeding from the uterus after childbirth. But remember, it drastically increases the blood pressure and cannot safely be used with mothers that have hypertension or preeclampsia. Moving on to Kaplan. Six hours after the vaginal delivery, the nurse notes perineal pad is soaked and there is blood underneath the client's buttocks. Which action does the nurse take first? This would be to assess the fundus. You really gotta massage it if it's soft and boggy. Question two, after delivery, the nurse administers oxytocin, and this medication is used for which purpose? So the answer here would be to stimulate firm contractions of the uterus. Moving on to HESI. There is profuse bleeding in a postpartum client, and the priority intervention would be to palpate the uterus and massage it if it's boggy. Now, which drug is used for treating a client with severe postpartum bleeding? This is oxytocin. Lastly, we have the Saunders NCLEX review. Question one is about the fourth stage of labor, an early sign of excessive blood loss. This would be an increased pulse rate of 88 to 102 beats per minute. And then question two, again on that fourth stage of labor, a client's perineal pad is saturated with blood and blood soaked into the bed linens. What is the initial nursing action? This would be to gently massage the uterine fundus. Now for the Loki assessment. This is normal discharge after birth. This is the sloughing off of the inner lining of the uterus. Now Lokia should become lighter in color and amount with each passing postpartum day. So it should start out heavy and red or rubra and then go pink brown serosa and finally return to white clear or elba. So normally there's three stages of Lokia. So Lokia rubra, as mentioned before, is that bright red flow, three to four days, with small clots. Now these are expected. Lokia serosa is pink brown around four to 10 days, and color turns from pink to brown with mucus and fewer clots. And lastly, Lokia elba is that white yellow around 10 to 28 days or longer, often described as a cream color. Now there should be no foul odor and no real flow here. If lochia ever becomes heavy in color or amount, this is a sign of potential infection or even retained placental fragments, which can lead to very heavy postpartum bleeding. Now, what is not normal and when to notify the provider, you guys should write this down. Large clots, malodorous or foul odor, could indicate infection. And a big one here is excessive bleeding one pad in 15 minutes. We need to report this to the provider. 
and we always check under the client for pooled lochia. This could indicate hemorrhaging. So Kaplan had a question here. A client gave birth three hours ago. A sudden gush of blood from the vagina while ambulating. Which is the most likely cause of bleeding? Lochia is pooled in the client's vagina. And ATI questions. Question number one. The nurse is assessing a client who delivered a baby three days ago. When assessing for lochia, the nurse notes pink discharge with a serosanguinous consistency. This is best described as lochia serosa. And a second question. A client six weeks postpartum. Which of the following findings is a normal sign for this client? Creamy color discharge with a fleshy odor. Okay, now switching gears to peri care. The good old peri care after delivery. We have to educate the mother about cleaning after urinating. So the top three to write down. We have to use a squeeze bottle with warm water. So this one was mentioned by ATI. And number two, always wipe from front to back. And three, blot dry. And for pain, the top five here. Number one is a SIDS bath. Number two is ice packs, which actually can also help in reducing swelling and decrease the risk for bladder distension. Number three is pharmacology, so we can use opioids or NSAIDs. And number four is topical witch hazel to help with hemorrhoids and also with the swelling. And lastly, number five, laxatives and stool softeners can help prevent constipation. And we don't want this constipation because it's going to cause more pressure and injury to the site, as mentioned by Hesse. So ATI mentions a client who has a episiotomy, proper perineal care. Use a squeeze bottle with warm water to keep the site clean. And Hesse, which medication is appropriate for postpartum client with perineal lacerations? Now experiencing constipation, laxatives. All right, that wraps it up. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take your quiz and download the study guides. And also feel free to share the love, share with a classmate and even your instructor. See you guys in the next videos.